Hi, good afternoon from New York. And uh, I'm in my office here, Deepak Home Base, with uh, my dear friend Jordan, right? Yes. Jordan Thomas. Absolutely. So Jordan Thomas uh, is from Newark, New Jersey, and he is going to change the world, starting from Newark, uh, New Jersey. He just won a Rhodes Scholarship, yes. right? He just became a Rhodes Scholar. Yes, 2018. 2018, and we'll talk about that. And uh, thank you for joining us. I will start a little bit with uh, Jordan's history and then his special mission uh, to transform lives, starting with his hometown in uh, Newark, New Jersey. So, Jordan, let me ask you, where were you born? How old are you, by the way? 21 years old. 21 years old, and you were born in... Uh, born and raised in North New Jersey. Okay, and you went to school there? I did. I uh, actually grew up in Newark, went to uh, Catholic school in the Ironbound section, so the east side of Newark, and then for middle school and high school, went to school in the south side of Newark, straight through the public school system uh, there. And so I'm actually the first Rhodes Scholar in the history of the Newark public school system. Cheers to Jordan. Please um, spread the word. If you can hear us clearly, uh, then press one of those uh, heart buttons if you're enjoying this conversation and share this video with other people as well. So when did you graduate from high school? 2014. And then what happened after that? So after that, I was very fortunate uh, in my high school years, I actually got into Princeton, Harvard, and Yale universities. And uh, Princeton just had a very special place in my heart, being so close to home for me, and I've always been very close to family. I ended up choosing Princeton and attending Princeton and having a very successful uh, academic career there and actually uh, just graduated. I'm a 2018 graduate of Princeton University. And, and what was your major? Uh, public and international affairs there with a focus on domestic policy issues like poverty and inequality. So what you're looking at is the face of the future, uh, leaders that we need if we want to have a more peaceful, just, sustainable, healthier and joyful world, then you're looking at the kind of leaders we want in the future, not necessarily the leaders we have right now. So uh, Jordan, um, Tell me a little bit about your family. Um, tell me a little bit. Do you have any brothers and sisters? You live, live with your parents. Tell me a little bit. So uh, on my mother's side of the family, um, they're actually immigrants from Portugal. They uh, immigrated over here probably about 35 years ago, almost 40 years ago. Uh, my mother, when she was very young, was so my So you're pro-immigration? Absolutely pro-immigration. I wouldn't be here if it weren't for the opportunity that, that my grandparents had and that my mother had. Um, and so on my mother's side, I'm, I'm the son of a Portuguese immigrant. And then on my father's side, uh, as African-American, uh, also like me, born and raised in Newark, really came from nothing. I mean, my, my father's side of the family, my grandmother, she was raising eight children in, in one of the very difficult areas in Newark, New Jersey. And as she was raising these eight children, and a lot of, for a large part of it really on her own, she was actually going and attending college. And so she was so committed to education and to trying to improve opportunity for her children that she was juggling all of that, working and still going to school. Um, and then you know raised just these wonderful children. And my father was so inspired by my grandmother's commitment to education and, and just that value that she had that my my father is actually now a teacher in the North Public School System trying to pay it forward and trying to you know, instill in other children that value of education and trying to give them that hunger for learning and knowledge. Um, and so that's, that's a bit about me. That's where I come from, born and raised in North. How many brothers and sisters do you have? I have two brothers, so both older. I'm the, I'm the youngest. Uh, one who's 10 years older, so he's 31, uh, and then one who's only nine months older, he's 22. And what do they do? Uh, so the eldest is uh, works for TD Bank, and the second oldest, the middle child, uh, is currently in school as well. He's taking classes at Essex County and um, is also working. He's very into food and, and restaurants and, and has even thought about starting his own restaurant. And so he's currently working in a restaurant right now. So how do you get to be a Rhodes Scholar? What's the process? 
<clears throat> so the Rhodes Scholarship, in essence, is a fully paid scholarship to study at the University of Oxford. It's, it's considered the most prestigious academic scholarship in the world. You have to have uh, tremendous... I know, I tried to put it in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry to hear that. But you, so you, you, I tried uh, when I was uh, 17, 18, oh, just wow. getting ready to go to medical school I didn't make it so I went to medical school. All right. Well it sounds like you've you've had a tremendous life, tremendous career and so I think it worked out uh, regardless. But you, you have to have the academics. In addition to that, they're all about character and leadership. The mission of the Rhodes Scholarship is they're, they're investing in individuals who they say are interested in fighting the world's fight. And so that looks a number of different ways. For me, I've chosen to fight the world fight through community engagement. I'm very involved in Newark and other urban communities and through law and politics. That's really what inspires me. But you can imagine for other people, it could be through medicine, it could be through research, it could be through academia, publishing papers, being a professor. And so however you, according to your own background and your story, have chosen to fight the world's fight while still adhering to the highest standards of academics, that's that's when you now become eligible to become a Rhodes Scholar and you have to go through a very competitive um, interview process and, and selection process and then that's when you get awarded the scholarship. And how many people are awarded the scholarship in the entire United States? So there are 32 American Rhodes Scholars with me being one of them and 97 uh, Rhodes Scholars across the world. 97 and so you're basically one of 30, how many? One of 32 in the U.S. In the U.S. And one of well, 97, 97 in the, world. the entire world. That's right. Well, congratulations. Your parents must be very proud of you. Oh, absolutely. They uh, they say all the time, it's, it's they can't even believe it. You know, it's you want so much for your children, but it's like, how can you imagine they become one of just 97 people in the world to, to become a Rhodes Scholar? Have you been to England before? <clears throat> I have. So in my freshman year, actually, I traveled to England as part of a, a different scholarship program program through a Fulbright scholarship and had a chance to spend a little over a month there and, and was just so blown away. I mean, it's just absolutely beautiful, the history there. And, and I tell you, it changed my life in a number of ways. But one way is I don't drink coffee. And I tell people this and they get so shocked. Uh, I only drink tea with milk the British <laughs> way. It changed my life. <laughs> okay, so now tell me, what, what is your life mission? What do you want to do at Oxford, for example? What are you going to do? So I'll be there for two years. In the first year, I'll receive a master's in policy evaluation. And then in the second year, I'll be pursuing an MBA. And I felt like that's really what gives me just this dynamic skill set between policy and business. And then when I return to the United States, I'll actually, I'm, I've already committed to Yale Law School. So I'll be going to law school. And it's that mix of business, policy, law that allows me, I think, to just have an impact on, on communities and to, and to really just try to advocate for people in need. That's what I consider to be my mission in this world. I tell people I want to return to Newark, and, and not just in Newark, but in other urban communities like Newark, I want to advocate for people. I want to try to counter issues like inequality, like um, academic gaps uh, in achievement, like uh, poverty. These, these are the issues that truly trouble me, the things that are, are really holding people back from thriving in the world and, and from, from achieving their full potential. All of these structural barriers and obstacles that people have to deal with in urban communities really trouble me. And, and having seen that firsthand in Newark, it really troubles me. And so that's my mission, is I want to have an impact on people. I want to help them achieve their full potential. So right now, as you look at the world situation and even uh, the situation in the United States, you look at leadership across the world, I think you can't uh, but help be a little frustrated because you see uh, cronyism and power mongering and influence peddling and corruption and bureaucracy. What do you think is wrong with the leadership? not just in our country, but across the world. What is happening right now? It looks like leadership is in a crisis. It is in a lot of ways. And, and to your point of, of am I frustrated, I, I, think, I think it's important to be a little frustrated, but not to be discouraged. And that's a, it's a distinction that I draw very often is, is, yes, be frustrated, be angry, go out there and want to create change. Oh, divine discontent. Exactly, divine <clears throat> discontent. Use it to fuel you, you know, but don't get discouraged. Don't be that person who says, oh, well, everything's messed up, and so what is, why is it even worth it? What am I doing this for? I take the opposite stance, and I, I tell you, I think that the issue is that we've lost touch with people. And that's why I'm all about remaining connected to my community, hearing from people, 
I, I, I think that if you become too enclosed in, in your privilege and opportunities that come to you, I understand, I'm very privileged. I've gone to Princeton University, I'm a Rhodes Scholar, I'll be going to Yale. You didn't come from a necessary But I didn't come from background, privilege, right? Exactly. And you didn't so, come from privilege. Not at all. And so it's about remaining connected to those other people who haven't had the same opportunity for me. And I want to know, what, what are you dealing with? What are the issues on your day to day? And it's about knowing and never forgetting where you came from. And I think that that's how you lead, right? You have to understand that you're not passing policies just for people who are like you. You're passing policies for people who come from completely different worlds as you. And you need to know where they're coming from to pass policies that can help them, right? That can actually really have an impact overall. And so I think that that's part of the crisis that we see in leadership is our leaders are losing touch with people. Uh, and, and I don't just mean, you know, it's hard to say what type of people we're talking about, but you need to be connected to all people. You need to understand people in this, in this country, in this world are coming from very different places. And as much as you can put yourself out there and hear all of their different stories, all of their different struggles, all of their different backgrounds, that's when you can really lead because now you have a sense of what truly needs to get done to affect people at all levels of society. See, and I have always keep an acronym in my mind about leadership and it's basically the word leaders, L-E-A-D-E-R-S. Yeah. That stands for look and listen with the mind, with the instruments of the heart and the soul, E for emotional connection and bonding, A for awareness, D for doing, E for empowerment, R for responsibility, and S for synchronicity. I love it. Uh, I'm going to send you my book, The Soul of Leadership. Thank I hope you. you'll read it. Absolutely. But now, at this moment, before you take off to Oxford, when, when do you go? I'll be leaving September, actually, because they work on a, a bit of a different schedule there, yes. so classes don't begin until October. And what's, so after you come back, you said you already applied to law school, right? Yes, I, I was so fortunate there as well. I applied pretty much straight through the top 10 and got into every law school that I applied Where to. Where are you going? Yale Law School. Yale Law School. Um, again, just, just absolutely so, so fortunate. What's, what's your vision for yourself after that? So for me, after Yale Law School, again, like I said, I want to return to my hometown of Newark and uh, perhaps do some nonprofit work there, or public interest work. Really, I tell people it's difficult to say now how exactly I want to have an impact in my city, whether that's through business, whether that's through law, through politics. All of this interests me because I understand that whether you're doing impact investment work, which is more business, or you're doing nonprofit legal work for underrepresented communities, uh, or, or you're just getting straight into politics, which also interests me as well, all of this helps people in different ways. And so ideally, I would, I would graduate from Yale Law School. I would take a look at Newark. I would take a look at, at the United States, I take a look at the world, and I would really just reflect and say, what, how is it that I can have the best impact? And so when people ask me, what is it that you want to do afterward, I tell people, I can't tell you exactly what it is that I want to do, but I know that it's going to involve impact, and it's going to involve people, and it's going to involve me taking a close look and seeing where can I fit right now, where's the most dire need, is that business, is it law, is it politics, and I'm going to take the route that allows me to have the best impact on people. So <clears throat> we came together today because a common friend of ours, yes. Ray Chambers, who is doing amazing work in New Jersey, empowering people, sending kids to school, engaged in the United Nations, uh, in major efforts to reduce, eliminate uh, chronic illness, but particularly focus on uh, malaria and AIDS and uh, tuberculosis, uh, an amazing human being Absolutely. who's in our lives. And yeah. he asked me to meet you because uh, you have a special request for somebody that we don't know personally. <laughs> and uh, we're going to send this video to him, Jeff Bezos. Yes. Uh, what is your special request uh, for uh, Jeff Bezos? founder of Amazon and uh, how does it connect with what you're doing and what's happening in New Jersey? 
So as a community advocate in Newark and as a person who has really devoted my life in a lot of ways and my future to having an impact in the city, one thing that's really just excited me and excited everybody in the city is that Newark was recently listed on Amazon shortlist for their second world headquarters. So they're currently in the process of looking at where they want to locate their second headquarters in the U.S. and they released a shortlist of 20 final candidates and Newark was on that shortlist. And there were a number of, of great cities on that list, but I tell you, there's no city like North. There's no city where there can be such a mutual benefit here. I, I mentioned this to everybody. They're, they're surprised to see Newark, and it's like, yes, Newark has so much to offer. We're a very diverse city, and we've, we've seen through studies in the past and research that there's a diversity bonus to be had in companies. It helps you with revenue. It helps you with productivity. And so that diversity and that culture in Newark would just be wonderful for Amazon. A transportation infrastructure in Newark with Newark Liberty Airport and with Newark Penn Station, very quickly you can get to New York, Washington, Boston. Um, there's a phenomenal tech and talent uh, pipeline in Newark, an education pipeline with institutions like Rutgers, New Jersey Institute of Technology. And so that's all waiting there for Amazon. But what really makes Newark different, and this is what I would just really urge Jeff Bezos, a fellow Princeton alum, I must say, a fellow Tiger, to consider is in no other city can you have the same social and human impact. So in Newark, we're talking about this Amazon move bringing 100,000 jobs to a city of just 270,000 people. We're talking about a complete economic and social transformation on a scale that we really haven't seen regionally in a very long time. It would help the city so much to just continue thriving. Newark, in a lot of ways, has been on a resurgence recently. And people have been so excited by the businesses coming in and by just an economic upscale that we've been on. But Amazon coming in would be different. Amazon would be exactly what Newark needs to just really just get supercharged and, and for lives to be transformed. And so that's what makes Newark different. We have the transportation infrastructure, we have the diversity, we have the education pipeline, everything that Amazon's looking for, but it's that extra step. It's We are really the only city on that list where Amazon coming in would just have a complete economic and social transformation. And it would just be this beautiful marriage of, of impact and profit and thriving for, for Amazon. And, and so that's what I would say to my fellow Princeton alum, Jeff Bezos, is I think about Princeton's informal motto, in the nation's service and in the service of humanity. And I think about how this is just such a beautiful opportunity for Jeff Bezos to come into a city, for his business to thrive, but at the same time, to be in the service of that city. This is an investment in the long term. This is an investment in lives in an entire city and to have that impact. So Jeff, please think about Princeton's informal motto. Please. It's not just about the business. The business is going to be great wherever you go. You are a, a mastermind in that sense and you have a wonderful company, but where can you go to really be in the service of people? That's in Newark, New Jersey. Okay, so Mr. Bezos, uh, a fellow uh, uh, alumnus is uh, asking you to please consider Newark as uh, your second headquarters. And I'm sure if that happens, You'll have Jordan um, helping you um, with social outreach, it's with uh, visionary leadership, in the face of the future. Our future not. needs leaders like, uh, like him, like Jordan. And um, we need people who can be the change they want to see in the world. Uh, for many, many years, uh, focused on just one idea, how to reach a billion people. <coughs> with personal and social transformation so they can help create a more peaceful, just, sustainable, healthier and joyful world. As you know, if somebody is living in poverty and somebody is worried about survival and living in a location where there's a lot of crime, then uh, things are against you, things are stacked up against you. Uh, New Jersey has had that reputation, nor particularly <coughs> in the past anyway, yeah. of being a very high crime rate. And yet in that ecosystem, we have people like you who end up being Rhodes Scholars and going to Princeton and Yale and making a difference in the world. So um, I hope you're all inspired. Uh, Jeff uh, Bezos, I hope uh, you watch this uh, video. We are going to... Uh, send it to you and uh, hope you'll consider Jordan's request. 
what happens if Newark wins? Uh, what are you going to do about it? If Newark wins, I want, I would love to, to actually have a chance to speak with Jeff Bezos and thank him. I know he's been a huge inspiration to me as he's been to many Princeton students who just look at, and you know, at any university, you look at your alumni for hope and inspiration. It's this dream of what can be, and, and that's what your successful alumni represent. And so as one of our most successful alumni ever, Jeff Bezos has been a huge hope and inspiration to me, and I would love to have a chance to, to just thank him. But beyond that, I want to start um, to, to utilize that Amazon opportunity and, and show other businesses, look, Amazon has come in, but this isn't the end. I don't view Amazon coming in as the end of my journey in Newark and as the end of, of this mission. There more still needs to be done, but that's what's so beautiful about Amazon coming in is it's one of the most successful com uh, companies in the United States and really the world. It is going to show other businesses that you can come into Newark, you can be successful from a profit perspective, from a business perspective, but also have an impact. And so other businesses are going to continue coming in and having an impact. And that's going to be the future of the world. Anybody who is not making a difference in the world and uh, has a business that is only focused on profit, I think will become irrelevant in the future. Uh, right now, uh, business needs to be re-examined. Make money for the shareholders, but also help improve the quality of life uh, wherever you are. In a business that means uh, uh, happy, healthy, joyful employees, and then that translates into happy, contented customers, which translates into uh, satisfied and contented investors. That's the loop. Employers, employees, customers, investors. But most important are the employees. If they're happy, then everybody else is happy. If they're engaged, then it makes a difference for everyone else. We hope Amazon will lead in New Jersey with that example, with their example of become, becoming one of the most uh, just and uh, progressive uh, businesses in the world. They're already probably the most successful business, but now we need to translate that into helping us create a more peaceful, just, sustainable, healthier and joyful world. And when we combine business with social and economic justice, with a focus on sustainability and a more peaceful environment, then we have the business of the future. So once again, Mr. Bezos, I hope you listen to Jordan's plea. And Jordan, I wish you the best. I Thank think you. you are the future of the world. You're looking at the future of the world leaders <laughs> right now. And um, I thank you for coming here and thank uh, you. helping me help you spread the word. Thank you. Take care and God bless.